So let's say you've been working with your shooting method code and you've got a whole bunch of wave functions psi n and a whole bunch of eigenvalues e n. And again, n here is, uh, is some subset of integers, maybe it's one, two, three, four, et cetera. It sometimes starts at zero, sometimes starts at one. What do you do with these things? What do they tell you? These stationary states are nice. What do they tell you about the wave function in general? Well, it turns out the stationary states, the reason we're interested in them, is because you can use them as building blocks for the wave function, right? So sometimes I get sloppy and I call this lowercase psi the wave function. It's really a special case of the wave function called stationary states. The wave function, the general wave function that describes the behavior in quantum mechanics, it's a function of both position and time, right? We need to allow this wave function to evolve or else nothing's really happening to our particle, right? It turns out these things are building blocks because what you can do, you can take each one of them, let's say, let's say we start with psi one, you can multiply it by a coefficient, call it C one, then multiply that by an exponential. Here's where things get a little hairy if you've never seen this before. We're gonna raise this to a negative power of I, times e n, or excuse me, times e1 t over h bar. Now, if you've never seen a, a, a complex number in an exponential, don't worry. Uh, we'll do a little sidebar here. There's this wonderful thing called Euler's formula that I don't remember which math class I learned it in. It's one of those things that we just kind of expect you to pick up in a physics education, but I don't know that it's formally taught in any one particular math class. The way it works, it's related actually to trig functions. This e to the i theta is a complex number, meaning it has a real part and an imaginary part. The real part is cosine of theta, and the imaginary part is sine of theta. I know, it looks weird because this is an imaginary number and an exponent, and this is telling you that e is related to sine and cosine. It's actually, uh, it makes a lot of sense if you think about it in terms of differential equations. So if this were your f, right? your f double prime would be uh, two i's times e to the i theta, right? And that would be negative e to the i theta, which is equal to negative f. So f double prime equals negative f is a differential equation that has sine and cosine as trig function, and it has e to the i theta as a solution, excuse me, is a, fun is a differential equation that has sine and cosine as solutions, and it has e to the i theta as a solution, which is pretty cool. So when we see this e to the i something, right, so just think of this as all one variable right now, it means it's a wave, it means it's a complex wave. It's oscillating in the real part and it's oscillating in the imaginary part. Not unlike an electromagnetic wave having an amplitude in one direction and an amplitude in the other direction, it's, it's a little bit like that. They're out of phase from each other because one's a cosine and one's a sine, but the important thing is that e to the i theta means it's an oscillating thing. Right, so this wave is oscillating in time along a real axis and along an imaginary axis. You can do that with each one of these pairs of en and psi n that you got. So you can have c2, psi2, e to the negative i, e2 t over h bar. You can do it for the threes, you can do it for the fours, you can do it for however many you got. Maybe you got a hundred out of the shooting method code. I doubt you did. But let's say you got a hundred of these eigenstates out of the shooting method code. You could do a hundred of these terms. The generic way of writing it is a summation on n of cn, psi n, e to the negative i, e n t over h bar. And so in principle, you can have an infinite number of these. In practice, you, you drop it off after five or something like that. What's neat about this is when you go back to calculate those expectation values, right? When you go back to calculate the expectation values, remember it's psi star. Uh, let's just try expectation value of x times psi dx. Well, now you've got something more interesting in here because it's not all necessarily going to cancel. So you'll have two sums, right? You'll have a sum on n and a sum on, uh, let's call it m. So you'll have this thing, you'll have cn star, psi n star, e to the positive i e n t over h bar. And then you'll have the same thing with the m's without the stars. So you'll have a cm psi m e to the uh, negative i e m t over h bar, and you'll have your x out here. And so what'll happen is uh, you've got some constants multiplying each other, you've got these two wave functions multiplying each other, but then you also have 
these two things multiplying each other, which is interesting. Um, it turns out that the, uh, the wave functions here, psi m and psi n, are what we call orthonormal. So in other words, they are going to uh, take this summation and actually uh, kill one of them because uh, it's, I shouldn't say that, they're going to take these summations and actually remove one of them because if you take integral, oh no, wait, sorry, we're integrating against dx. You're right. You're integrating against that, excuse me. Never mind. I'll do that. Boop, boop. And so what happens with this piece in red here is you get e to the i en minus em t over h bar. And this is the thing that makes the expectation value of x oscillate up and down with respect to time because you've got this difference in energies here. They don't cancel out because they're automatically different from each other. And so this is going to make this expectation of x value oscillate as the thing evolves in time. By the way, this thing also has a normalization condition. If you want to take the expectation value of 1, you had better get 1 out as the answer. So that needs to equal the integral of uh, these two things against each other without a number in the middle or with a 1 in the middle. So that means a sum on n, a sum on m, c star n, c m, psi star n, psi m, and then e to the thing we have up here, i, en minus em, t over h bar dx. Well, the only things that depend on x here are the two sides, right? These are constants. This is a function of time. So this is the only thing that depends on x. And it turns out that these uh, stationary states are what we call orth orthonormal, meaning if they are different, if n doesn't equal m, then you automatically get 0, right? It's like taking the dot product of two perpendicular vectors. And if n equals m, you get 1 from the normalization we had to set up for these. And so what you'll end up with is that 1 has to equal a sum on n of the absolute value of cn squared, because you'll have en minus en, right? Because you'll only have terms where these two are equal. So that gives you e to the 0, gives you 1. And so you'll end up with 1 equals this. So your only constraint when you're constructing this wave function is that the sum of all of the coefficients, absolute value squared, has to equal 1. Relatively easy to ensure that you construct. So to get you used to the idea of this time evolving wave function, let's start with a simple example. Let's suppose that you only have three wave functions and they're all cosines. All right, so we're going to take a cosine using k1 a cosine using k2, and a cosine using k3. Um, you get to specify in the sliders down here what the k values are and what their, their coefficients are. So this is setting up uh, to have a1 multiplying the cosine with k1, a2 multiplying the cosine with k2, and a3 multiplying the cosine of k3. We're taking care of the normalization here with the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared. And we've got all these sliders that we can play with. So we get to create the animation by taking the step slider and dragging it across. This is going to move the animation forward one step at a time. And so you can see I get this nice animation. It's a wave moving forward. It's what you pretty much expect. Uh, things get more interesting when we start to bring in the other wave. So let's bring in the uh, the wave with double the original wave number here. So you can see I'm getting some interference. I'm getting some constructive interference here and some destructive interference over here. Now when I animate this, not only do I have the wave moving forward, but the shape of the wave itself is moving. Oh, look, I almost get equal amplitudes there. Oh, but I'm getting this really broader valley there. That's interesting. And so you can watch this thing. You can scrub it forward and backward. Uh, you can watch this thing evolve forward in time. You can get them to do a little dance there. That's interesting. Um, things also get interesting when you bring in a third wave. Let's just have this one go backwards, shall we? Uh, so now I've got a wave moving to the left on top of a wave moving to the right, which is pretty neat. So this gives you a general idea of how these uh, wave functions behave. <clears throat> This code, however, requires you to know what the wave functions are in terms of a function. We need to be able to put in the function here, which, of course, we don't usually know. Usually, we get the wave function numerically. 
Let's take a look at how that process works out with the official time evolution of a wave function. So what you're gonna do here is rerun your code from the shooting method. So you're gonna to have to enter the uh, energy eigenvalues that you found with the shooting method. You come down here, you should get the same graphs that you had before. Um, and you're gonna do this three times. Do it for three different values of the energy eigenvalues here. Go E1, E2, and E3. Again, you can confirm that you got the same graphs for the stationary states that you had before. Then what you're gonna do is set up your coefficients. So you have the coefficient for wave function one, coefficient for wave function two, coefficient for wave function three, for all three of those stationary states. Uh, let's go ahead and normalize those, shall we? So we'll take the normalization here as C1 times squared plus C2 squared plus C3 squared. And then we'll say C1 gonna divide by uh, square root of norm. Actually, don't need the NP there. And then do the same thing for C2 and C3. So we're gonna take those and normalize them so you have a proper uh, normalized wave function. Uh, then we come down here and we are going to set up the time, or the time values that you wanna look at this thing. So then instead of having a formal animation, this is gonna show you different snapshots of the wave function moving forward in time. So you pick several different values of time that you want here. It will then carry out the construction of the wave function here. So this IRA, this is the wave function gonna be built out of the stationary states. And you notice I've left you a couple question marks here for you to complete this part. So you basically take this part, copy and paste it over here, do the same thing for C1, for C2, Psi2, and E2, then copy and paste that, do the same thing for C3, Psi3, E3, and it's gonna give you a plot of the entire wave function at those different snapshots in time. Uh, now what you might notice, we replace that e to the i stuff with cosine because it's really cosine plus i times sine. So later on down here, I'll have you calculate the imaginary part where you're basically repeating that code, but you're replacing the uh, cosine with a sine. Then you come down here, calculate the modulus where you can have the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared all underneath a square root. And that's gonna give you a really interesting time evolved wave function. Uh, then you scroll down here, and this is where you actually calculate the expectation value of x. It's the same Riemann sum that you were using before. The difference is now it's being looped inside of a time array so that you get several different snapshots of this value over the course of time. Uh, it's gonna graph your expectation value versus time here. So for each one of those snapshots you had of the wave function, you're going to get a different data point for the expectation value of x. And this is really what's going on in the quantum mechanics universe. You start with the potential energy, you have these stationary states that build up the wave function that evolves in time that determines what the motion of the particle is like. And it only took us, uh, what, four Jupyter notebooks to illustrate that. Anyway, hope you have a lot of fun with this. This really is quantum mechanics in action. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.